if you're here, you likely know the benefits of having a home server for self-hosting or home labbing. Whether your goal is to disconnect from the cloud, have a place to learn and experiment, run your own home media streaming empire with Plex or Jellyfin, or something else, having a dedicated server has tons of benefits, but knowing where to start in terms of hardware can be tricky. Welcome home lovers and self-hosters, Rich here. There are so many options when it comes to deciding on what hardware to use for a server for home. And since there's no such thing as a one size fits all answer to the question, it's hard to know if you're making the right choice. In this video, we'll be doing a deep dive into different options for home server hardware and the pros and cons of each. Then we'll find a system we like, buy it, build it out, and in future videos, install different software to run on it. You ready? Let's get to it. Computer architecture is the logical place to start here because knowing the benefits and limitations of a CPU architecture will have an effect on the direction you decide to go. So let's talk about the pros and cons of each and why you might choose one over another. In the world of computing, there are two major CPU architectures that we use every single day, x86 and ARM. Let's start with x86 CPUs. You may have not heard the term x86, x86-64, or AMD64 before, but you've undoubtedly heard of Intel and AMD, the two major x86 CPU manufacturers today. These CPUs are used in everything from tiny single board PCs all the way up to incredibly powerful and power hungry servers. First pro is compatibility. X86 CPUs are widely used and supported by most server and desktop operating systems, applications, and software. If you're in love with an operating system, application, or game, it's going to run on an X86 CPU. Next pro is performance. X86 CPUs have a long history of development and optimization, and they can handle complex tasks quickly and efficiently. While ARM is catching up, X86 CPUs still hold the crown for the most computing performance for general computing. Lastly, upgradability. X86 CPUs are typically modular components in a PC and can be upgradable, which gives your hardware a potentially longer lifespan. On top of this, depending on your CPU generation, your other components like the RAM and the motherboard are typically compatible with newer CPUs, giving you simple in-place upgrade options. Now let's talk about the cons. The first con is power consumption. X86 CPUs are generally less power efficient than ARM CPUs, which means they require more power to operate and that can mean a higher electricity bill for you every month. The second con is heat production. X86 CPUs can generate a lot of heat, and higher powered CPUs require additional cooling considerations to deal with that excess heat. And finally, cost. X86 CPUs are often more expensive than ARM CPU-based systems, especially for higher-end models. Now let's talk about ARM CPUs. ARM CPUs aren't typically made available to buy and drop into a motherboard like X86 CPUs from Intel or AMD. The company that owns the intellectual property for ARM licenses its processor designs to other companies which then integrate them into their own products. For example, the mobile phone in your pocket runs on an ARM processor specially designed for your phone. In terms of a home server, this means you're looking at an SBC or single board computer like a Raspberry Pi or a rock chip based system. Anyway, let's get to the pros of ARM based systems. The first pro is power efficiency. ARM CPUs are designed to be energy efficient, which makes them ideal for use in low-powered applications like IoT devices, mobile phones, and low-powered computers. The next pro is cost. ARM CPUs are often less expensive than x86 CPUs, especially for low-end systems. And now, on to the cons of ARM-based systems. First off, compatibility. ARM CPUs are not as widely supported by desktop operating systems, applications, and software. And depending on the design of the SOC or system on chip, you may have very few options in what you can run on it. Next is performance. ARM CPUs are not as powerful as x86 CPUs for complex computing tasks. ARM CPUs are constantly improving and are suitable for most everyday computing needs, but outside of Apple's ARM CPUs, heavy computational workloads will struggle. And lastly, upgradability. Because ARM-based systems are typically designed for a specific purpose, you cannot upgrade the CPU, RAM, and in some cases, the storage on an ARM-based computer. There are more than just x86 and ARM architectures available these days, but the reality is that the up-and-coming architectures like RISC-V aren't yet as well adopted or performant enough to really hold their own. This will likely change in the future, but even then, x86 and ARM will still be big players in the space. Which decision you make here is going to depend on your plans for your home server. If power consumption is your concern, ARM-based systems will always give you the best performance per watt. Though there are some x86 CPUs on the market from Intel, like their Atom and Celeron CPUs, that are power efficient. If your objective are maximum compatibility and high performance, you'll do best at going something x86 based. For our needs, we're going to choose x86 here because we want power and performance. Okay, 
Now that we've worked out what our architecture for our server is based on, let's talk about form factors. The term form factor refers to the physical size, shape, and layout of a device or component. It basically describes how the hardware is designed and built. Different computer components such as motherboards, power supplies, and cases have different form factors that dictate their size and shape. For example, a desktop computer might have a form factor that's designed to fit a specific size of motherboard, while a laptop might have a form factor that's optimized for portability. Your decision on form factor will affect things like your upgradability and performance. For the sake of simplicity, let's narrow down the myriad of different types of form factors into three buckets, small, medium, and large. Small being small form factor PCs, medium being desktops and tower servers, and large being rack-mounted server gear. Let's go over the pros and cons of each. Let's start off with the small category. The pros of choosing a small form factor are, first, they're small. They're small and compact in size and take up physically less space in your home. Next, power savings. They're often more energy efficient than larger form factors because their size prevents them from having high-powered CPUs and components inside. Third, portability. They're easily transportable and can be put almost anywhere in your home. And lastly, quiet. And this is a big one. They're quieter and less noticeable than larger systems. Now, on to the cons of small form factors. First, limited upgradability. There's limited space for expansion and upgrades, and depending on their design, it may not be upgradable at all. Secondly, tight spaces. Access to the internals can be more difficult and harder to work with when you're working inside the PC. Third, cooling can be an issue. Cooling can be an issue for smaller form factors if you try to use higher performance hardware in a smaller design. Lastly, thermals. Internal temperatures will be a limiting factor and will dictate what CPUs can be reliably used in the system. On to the pros of the medium category. Again, medium encompasses desktops as well as standalone server towers. First off, more space. Typically, you'll find more space for upgrades, adding cards, and storage. Next, larger but not too large. Generally, tower form factors are still fairly compact, space-saving, and won't look out of place in a home. Third, better cooling. When space isn't an issue, you're free to use higher performance CPUs that would require more space for larger cooling. And lastly, less compromise. There's a good balance between performance, physical size, and flexibility to grow with you as needed. And now onto the cons of a medium-sized system. First, power consumption. A larger system allows you to use more power-hungry components and that can lead to increased running costs. Second, larger footprint. A larger system means it will be more visible and these systems can be less portable or easy to move compared to smaller form factor systems. Lastly, they're more expensive. Typically, a larger system capable of more functionality will be more costly to purchase than a smaller form factor system. And finally, the large form factor systems. Remember, we reserved this category for rack-mounted server hardware. On to the pros. First, space for days. Lots of space for expansion and upgrades, and depending on the type of server chassis you have, tons of storage upgradability as well. Secondly, easy access to internals for upgradability. Generally, rack servers are the easiest to work with because the entire top opens to provide access within. Third, density. You can pack a lot of power into a relatively compact space in a server rack. Lastly, and this is my favorite, hands-on experience with server gear. If part of your plan for your home lab is learning and working with server gear, having it at home solves that for you and gives you first-hand experience with it. This is very valuable if your home lab is focused on elevating your career. Now let's get to the cons. First, space. If you choose to go with large rack-mounted server gear, you're going to need a server rack or cabinet to hold it all, and that means a dedicated space just for your home lab. Secondly, they can be loud. Servers keep themselves cool with the aid of high-performance fans, and depending on the size of the server chassis and the heat they produce, they can sound like a jet engine 24-7. Thirdly, they're typically not energy efficient. Servers are designed to maximize performance, and they do this by utilizing high-performance CPUs and components that can devour power. Fourth, there's no portability with rack servers. They will live in a specific place in your home unless you move your rack. And finally, they're typically overkill for a home lab. Unless your dream is to run your own mini data center or you're running a business that needs storage and compute, you're better off with smaller solutions. Again, what you choose is going to depend on what your use case is for your lab. For us, the best compromise between upgradability, performance, size, and power consumption is going to be a desktop tower system. So now we know two things here. We know we want an x86-based system, and we think a tower form factor is the right size for us. Our next stop is to decide on a CPU. In terms of x86 CPUs, there are essentially two different classes of processors, consumer-focused desktop CPUs and business-focused server-slash-workstation CPUs. Both AMD and Intel make CPUs for both of these verticals, and both types will work fine for a home server. So let's discuss what to look for in choosing a CPU. 
In all CPUs, cores and clock speeds are the key deciding factors. The more cores you have on your CPU, the more parallel tasks you can execute concurrently. If you're virtualizing, core count is important as the more cores you have, the more concurrent workloads you can run. Coming in a close second is clock speed. Slower speed chips compute slower, which means you'll be waiting longer for tasks to be completed. Choosing a CPU with a higher clock speed is an important thing to consider. Whether you choose a consumer class CPU over a business class CPU will depend on your use case and your budget. Typically, you'll find desktop class systems more affordable, and if you're so inclined, you can easily build one yourself. On the opposite side, choosing a business class CPU will unlock server-grade features like ECC memory, more PCI Express lanes for adding cards, and typically a lot more cores per socket than a desktop CPU. And because of those added features, they typically cost more. And while you can build your own server from scratch using those chips, it's not typically done. I'm a fan of using server-grade hardware for my home lab because of the additional features like ECC memory support, increased bus connectivity, lights out or remote access connections, and more. So we're gonna focus on business class CPUs for this build. All right, our next step is to find a system that fits our needs. Let's head over to eBay and find a good system at a good price. After some rather exhaustive searching, we came across this system right here. This is a Dell Precision 5820 workstation at a fantastic price. This system rocks a 6-core Intel Xeon W2133 3.6 GHz CPU and comes with 32 gigs of DDR4 ECC RAM, which is a perfect amount for running any number of different OSs in our home lab. We were able to get the price of the system down to $293 with shipping to our door. All we need is some storage and a GPU, and we're good. <laughs> And here it is, and it's in fantastic condition. Let's talk over the features of this workstation and why I chose this particular chassis. I decided on the Dell Precision 5820 for a bunch of reasons. First, the CPU. The Intel Xeon W2133 CPU has six cores, 12 threads, and a base clock of 3.6 gigahertz that boosts to 3.9 gigahertz. That's a ton of power that will handle practically anything we throw at. We can easily run VMware ESXi, XCPNG, Proxmox, you name it. The next reason was the RAM. This system came delivered with 32 gigabytes of ECC memory, which is the perfect amount for a starter home lab. And because it's ECC memory, we unlock the ability to install TrueNAS scale if we want, which is fantastic. As a side note, this system will support a maximum of 512 gigabytes of RAM, just in case you're wondering about RAM upgradability. Third, the storage options. Under the covers in the front of this host, there are four removable drive bays. On the bottom are two 2.5 or 3.5 inch SAS capable disk bays. And on the top, there are two flex bays that allow you to add removable NVMe SSDs to the host. There's also a five and a quarter full size drive bay for later add in storage, a bay for a slimline DVD-R drive, which our host did not come with. And there's also an SD card reader in the front of the case as well. Just a ton of different storage options. Fourth, expandability. This host came with a total of five electrically active 16x PCIe slots, and surprisingly, one good old-fashioned PCIe slot just in case you've got some old piece of legacy gear you can't live without. Having that much connectivity inside the host means you can add any number of different add-in cards like GPUs, high-speed networking, RAID cards, or even more NVMe storage if you want. We're missing a few things here. For example, the host didn't come with the GPU, the W2133 CPU doesn't have embedded graphics, so we need to take care of that, and there's the fact the system has no storage, so we're going to need to get some storage for this as well. Also, those two flex bays up front don't have sleds for the NVMe disks, so we'll need to get two of those as well before we can use those bays. So, back to eBay I went in search of those two Dell Flex Bay NVMe sleds. And not surprisingly, I found them at the same seller I bought the chassis from. They originally wanted a bit over $33 a piece, so I offered them $15 and they countered with $25, which is fair, and I bought them. As a side note, when using eBay for used gear for your home lab, don't hesitate to make an offer when you have that option. Many of the sellers on eBay are genuinely good people and honest businesses and are willing to make a deal with you, assuming you're realistic about your offer. Also, one last thing to add, when you find a good seller on eBay, save that seller and try to do repeat business with them when they have the parts you need. It's like voting with your dollar, you're rewarding good sellers with your return business. Here are the two Flex Base LEDs purchased from eBay. This is my first time working with Flex Base and I like them. It's a pretty novel way to make an NVMe removable and upgradable without having to pop open the case and dig inside for your NVMe's. We'll be installing 500 gigabyte Western Digital Blue NVMe SSDs in them. The installation is very simple. We just remove three screws, install the NVMe SSD, and close it back up. We'll also be throwing in two 4 terabyte Western Digital Red Pro NAS drives in this host that we have on hand. If you have spare disks lying around, you could also use those for storage. 
Installing the mechanical hard disks into the sleds is also super easy since these are screwless sleds. You just pop the drives into the sled, making sure the pins on the rubber grommets slip into the screw holes on the drives, and you're done. And finally, we needed a GPU. Luckily, I had an old AMD RX 580 laying around that will now find a new home in this server. This card, minus its fan shroud, is an old power color Red Devil with 8GB of RAM. It was a great card back in the day, and it'll work well for this home server. Installation is just like any other computer. We'll just drop it into the first PCI Express slot on the mainboard, and plug in its power connections, and away we go. The Precision 5820 has two 6 plus 2 PCI Express power connectors just for GPUs, so if you're considering putting in a beefy graphics card, it'll handle it. Okay, GPU mounted, flex bays inserted, hard disks inserted, that's all there is to it. Let's talk about the total price since I'm sure I'll get some flack for all the extra stuff I had on hand, and I think that cost transparency is important here. The chassis cost me $293. The two flex base sleds cost $50. The two WD Blue 500GB NVMEs were $62. The two Western Digital Red Plus 4TB drives were $130. And the RX 580 off of eBay goes for around $80, making the grand total for this build $615, or the going price of three Raspberry Pis. I'm kidding. Whenever you get a chassis like this, before you put it back into service, I recommend doing some maintenance like blowing out dust in the system and replacing the thermal paste on the CPU. This system was built in March of 2019, making it four years old, which isn't bad at all. But it's enough time on the clock that I wanted to replace the thermal paste on the CPU. And it's a good thing that I did. When I pulled the heatsink off the CPU, I found the old thermal paste had become dry and hardened, which means less quality cooling. And it's easily fixed. We just popped the CPU out, cleaned off the chip and the base plate of the HSF, and applied our favorite thermal paste, Arctic MX6. We're using the three-line application method here, but consider using a complete spread if you're a completionist. Once that was done, we reattached the HSF, replaced the air ducting, and booted the system. And our new home server booted right up without issue. Once in the UEFI BIOS, we had to look around to make sure that all of our added hardware, like the NVMEs and the mechanical SATA disks, were detected and available, and that any additional features we wanted to use, like virtualization support, were enabled. Everything is healthy and ready to serve awesome. I am so excited to get this system up and running. Now, $615 may be out of your budget for your server, but I'm hoping that the discussion in this video has helped you come close on what you want to choose for your home server. Either way, I'd love to know your thoughts and if this video was helpful. As mentioned at the top of the video, we're going to be installing and discussing different home lab and home server OSs and use cases with this hardware. If you're interested in seeing something in particular tested on this system, please leave me a comment below and we'll add it to the list. And that, friends, will do it for this video. If you enjoyed it, throw us a sub or a like, and if you have a beef with anything I said, get down those comments and let me know. And now that you've finished watching this video, how about checking out our home lab and virtualization playlist over here? If you're looking to get into home labbing or self-hosting, we've got you covered.